Hey everybody, welcome to a special edition of Retro Tech, and I just wanted to give a little introduction to this next segment. I did invite my friend Louis Zezeran from Zez Retro, and many of you know that I do a podcast over there with him weekly. We wanted to do a podcast-style discussion about CRT preservation. So in this discussion about CRT preservation, please note that we are focusing on museums and the art world and how CRTs are still important for art pieces and artists all over the world to be able to portray uh, 20th century art pieces that involved the art medium of CRTs. Uh, how do they preserve that? How do they maintain CRTs that they already have and this is just more of an announcement too that I have gotten a contract where I will be going and working with uh, museum people over the next couple of weeks here in the United States and so I wanted to kind of give you a notice of that I'm really excited so if uh, you watch this interview and you're wondering why I'm so jacked up and kind of talking fast it is because I'm really excited uh, to be doing this and I really wanted to bring you the audience in on it and have you involved you know as kind of a way to follow along and see how CRT preservation restoration and uh, this whole culture of CRTs and needing it not just for video games but also for art pieces is uh, really important so thanks again for joining me today and I hope you enjoy this special edition of the cathode ray podcast Welcome everyone. Episode 21 of the Catho Ray podcast. We are having a special episode for 21. Happy 21. Uh, we are on the main Retro Tech channel. We've got a shorter episode today because we want to talk specifically uh, and have a chat with Steve about some of the special projects he has coming up. He's got some really exciting new opportunities that are coming up, uh, not to do with video games, but to do with CRT preservation. So we wanted to put this shorter conversation onto the main channel because we know that's something that you guys uh and gals are, are, are very interested in and later on we're going to put the other you know sort of rambly fun uh not that this is not fun sort of episode <laughs> to the zez retro channel so let's get into talking about your current project steve first of all i haven't seen you for a few weeks how you doing mate yeah it's great to see you too lewis it's been quite a little bit of a break here we had uh some things going on behind the scenes and uh kind of one of the reasons that we wanted to have this special kind of condensed version of the show here today again as you said uh but if you do really enjoy this we'll you know there's the show is always on over at the uh Zez Retro channel and we have weekly podcasts there so you can definitely catch up on anything if you haven't seen anything to this point but this condensed episode is pretty much primarily about uh, the future of CRT preservation right now and current kind of things that are happening uh, and this is not like you said within the video game world we're talking about uh, more about the art world and uh, video preservation world mm. and analog video from earlier formats and this all started from a job that I have been working and negotiating together behind the scenes since like right after COVID happened yeah ages and, you've been working yes on this, I, know. I mean for like two years uh, this has been talked behind the scenes and it was of course terrible timing when we first started discussing this plan at least with the initial museum that um, we're going to finally go out and work on this course with, uh, but mm. the, the, the plan started where they contacted me and then everything shut down. So they had no, <laughs> nobody that was willing to come to the uh, presentation. Now this, mm. let me just get this straight. This is not yeah, like break a it down for us first. It's not, it's not like a publicly open presentation. This is a museum that has contracted me to go out to them develop a uh, preservation and restoration program almost kind of um, some rules and guidelines and a little bit of like a three-day crash course on training them and getting them up to speed on just how to generally look at a CRT service it uh, keep notes on it you know get inside some of their specific units that they really use a lot of and uh, so there's there was this limitation of what I thought was originally just planned to be one museum, but then this single museum contacted other organizations behind the scenes within the museum <laughs> industry to see if anybody else was interested. And then he called me back and he's like, there's going to be five spectators here and 
Three of them are from like the biggest organizations in the museum world and manage thousands of CRTs that are stored away. <laughs> so I guess in, there's a few things. Like Let's try and um, yeah. give some quick backstory for the people. So first of all, just my, my first point to note out is this um, presentation, this seminar that you're giving primarily at the start, it's educating museum technicians uh, so that they can do their own preventative maintenance on a day-to-day -day basis themselves at first. That's what the focus of this one is about? That's what my original thought was on it until like I, I that that was the original entire plan here was for me to develop mm -hmm. this kind of course, go through and since it was going to be three days, it was going to be a, a first day of a lot of things going over basic safety uh, around a CRT, even as down to just handling it properly so you don't injure yourself moving it. And all the way up to you know breaking them down and 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 servicing them and getting them to where they have the ability to service them in house you know with a couple of technicians that's exactly what i had originally planned on mm. until until the uh <laughs> until the conference call i had with the museum curator yesterday and he explained to me that all these new people were coming out and he kind of wanted to alter that to encompass a whole lot more than just the um just the electronics that's he's like that's a big part we definitely want to keep mm. that in there but i don't want it to be just focused on the repair stuff now so i've got kind of a list of things and um so one like of the what? things what, what like, extra? Well, yeah. one of the things for example is he really he's like i really like your um and then he sent me some demonstrations that are like private webinar th things that uh are for the museum you know like they pay for companies to make these webinars and they're parts of these organizations so they're not anything like i could release the public i would or anything like that or aren't no, sure. released. so this is all so yeah, this is like behind the scenes stuff, industry sure. stuff mm -hmm. and uh yeah so they're you know they're they're interested in um he said they they there's a place for your crt history presentation Hmm, like okay. the, the one I've done before that I've mm -hmm. done at gaming conferences a few times that's on the channel um, that's been there for years, the CRT masterclass that I have put up. So that he's like, that presentation would be great. And I'm like, yeah, it would be great. But then I need to chop out all the video game um, aspects of it, you know, so I definitely need to go in and clean it up. Mm -hmm. But that's like so I'm starting to think, you know, that's probably going to be the starting point is a good uh, kind of hour clearing out that all the video game stuff and going at a more reduced pace on that presentation through because it's like an 80 slide presentation so i could definitely sure. get rid of like 20 of them <laughs> and and clean it up so i'm gonna start with that presentation like i like that i like that presentation and then he sh shared a webinar with me with presentations that were similar to that only different aspects of things, not as like detail focused on the exact like this was the guy who invented this thing. And this was the reason it was so important and going all the way back to the first CRTs, which had nothing to do with uh, a mm. display in the 1800s. So uh, anyway, they liked that. So he's like, yeah, put that in there. And then um, they have tons of Sony PVM 2030s. The museums do. They love the 2030. It's one they've always used in older exhibits from the time period of the 90s when these were live going on. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for them to recreate that if they just have the same monitor. Whereas sure, sometimes sure. you go use a custom monitor from that time period and it's impossible to get the exact same monitor mm -hmm. at the other end. So uh, it's going to go from that history presentation and into the 2030 class which is going to okay. be a really lot of fun i'm going to take uh, particularly because it's so common with so common, and he's that, like yeah. this is one this is the one that i've got here and um, i'm going to go through for an hour or two and i'm just going mm -hmm. to have every board i'm taking i'm taking mm -hmm. a spare board of every single board in that monitor that i have mm -hmm. here it's just scrap and i'll hold up the boards and then i'll show the boards inside the monitor and i'll have slides and then um We'll do like live demonstrations where I'll have power hooked up and I'll do the I'll pull. I'm going to bring out a Super Nintendo and pull up the <laughs> 240p test suite. And then I'm going to show them all. They will laugh probably uh, about seeing that. And then I'm just going to hit I'm going to sit there and wonk out the controls and just like freak mm. them out, just like showing them live there. And uh, so 
then you know that, that I can really focus in on a lot of things that 2032, like safety and tips on boards, like how to look for um, repair issues. And then after that, they've got the Dotronics monitors, which are somewhat a, a more industrialized, just shadow mask monitor uh, that a lot of them have bought for video walls, very plain metal. And it's the same guy who Bob had on an interview a few years ago or a couple years ago about his company still made them and they don't have very many of them left. Like, I remember that. Do you remember old, this? Like, he's got some new old stock and he's yes, using them and he to was construct making, something. Right. Yeah, okay, okay. So this gentleman is about, I mean, I think he's about, you know, out pretty much of monitors at this point right. and he has no new um, plan for, or ability at least right now to get anything consistently in so we're going to run through a dotronics monitor in a similar fashion to the 2030 and then i'm imagining that's going to take up the full four hour segment of that afternoon is sure. that little section of the course so it's really easy mm -hmm. i was like i thought i was going to be struggling to get through this but when i start thinking about it the amount of questions he's like be prepared for questions and that's always my favorite thing anyway sure. i can't sit there and not like i love I know you do from a stand up comedian perspective, you probably, I mean, that's just part of it. You want the audience sure. participation, reaction. It mm -hmm. all makes it a lot more enjoyable than just sitting there through a um, nerdy CRT pres presentation. <laughs> so. so the museums came back to you and they said, hey, look, we like to show the maintenance, but we want you to go deeper on these particular types of monitors because they're common to what we're doing. And is that. So is that the new part that the, the, they really well, yeah, want something deep on that? that? And that's just like half of it. And then they're just like okay. spewing out all more stuff they want me to talk about. So um, one of the other things is it's like they're they're not they they struggle to ha when they're trying to recreate a lot of these exhibits. You can look up specific exhibits, and I have um, a name for you if anybody feels like they want to Google something. It's Bruce Nauman. And he used to do video with pro monitors, like these weird Andy Warhol looking um, art style in the like 70s and 80s and 90s. And these uh, these would include like some weird thing on a video loop on a monitor that was just very kind of disturbing. It's like one was in clown torture. It was just like a, a lady dressed as a clown in a white room, just like yelling, ah! nonstop on a video loop on a PVM <laughs> as part of this exhibit. But if you go back and look at like how it was done originally, they weren't using the PVMs that are exactly in use now because it was maybe before that, before they existed. So they're trying to either contemporary, like to make that switch up to something that is um, as close as to the original as possible or um, get the original set up. So mm -hmm. I worked with the Bruce Nauman project with the Philadelphia Museum of Art a couple years ago, and specifically um, the Bruce Nauman project there, they loved the 20 M2 MDUs to be used in the white room because it was an all white monitor. And mm -hmm. like I helped them design that, or not design this actual thing, but I helped them get two perfect 20 M2 white mm -hmm. monitors and they were just ecstatic about that so uh, they use those monitors so you can look at like you can look at like old pictures of these and how it var varies because it's going from art museum to art museum and it's all in like a, a, a plain white room and ob the, the the room is the art you know it's like you mm -hmm. the whole ambiance of the room there'll be a couple of weird things on the wall and reflections of the floor as the lights go down and so it's all that's all part of the art experience. So I guess have, that's yeah. For, go ahead. for just a second, let's um. And I realize we should have got to this already. Sort of maybe going um where you, you right now you've explained sort of one exhibition, but to just more to let's take a step back and like why and let's explain to people why museums are interested in CRTs. Yeah, and that's why. Um. So, okay, we might have all been to a museum and we've seen some piece there and there's a TV and it displays something or we get the idea that we might walk in and there's a bit of a TV wall and there's a couple of TVs and, you know, there's something playing there, right? Mm 
And there's a, there's some nuance, as you say, there's some nuance to explain to this um, because while you might think, ah, just stick a TV in there and it works, um, the artists often, and I think mostly, created these installations with particular TVs in mind, looking for a particular set. Some of these artists knew just as much about CRTs as many of us who are listening right now, the way the look, the, the masks, the, the screen you know, reflections and so forth. And so it's extremely important to the art i think to the to the the integrity of the art in many cases that it is exactly the monitor that the artist designed this for and you might say well, what's the what's the freaking difference well true what is the, well, what is art you know then what does any of this <laughs> well that's what does any yeah, of this like, shit mean then why, why the would meantime? you go look at the uh, um, the mona lisa in person if you could just google a picture of it on your phone you know that's sure, the same sure. thing why so, does any of it matter a, what's the difference between a print and original it's like well, here's the thing. You brought so, it up. Yeah, per- it you, you brought it up perfectly. And sometimes I can get you know lost on a, a <laughs> detail of something else. It doesn't matter. Yeah, they are completely concerned always with the the closest to recreation. And and then another example is a like you have a Korean artist that in the '90s made an a exhibit, and they could only get a a cheap, crappy Korean tube from their area. And they fed mm-hmm. it composite, and part of the art was the fact that it was it's like it was made on that composite medium, that it was always going to be limited to the composite look of that television. So you can't just say, "Oh, a PVM is the best thing for this." And that's specifically what this art or this museum curator told me. He's like, they have a hard time understanding that they can't just use like the PVMs for everything. And it's like, yeah, sometimes the artist was never had never had access to the PVM, so the art was designed around the limitations of those sets. And so that part of interference is part of this. So you have pro they have problems using you know, so that's that's another whole aspect of this is I have to go through and explain how original artists were intending with this stuff and you need to sometimes think about your art medium as like not only was it what kind of tube was it on was it on a trinitron was it on a shadow mask was it on a shadow mask from this time period that would have been looking Mm. like this or and was the format composite video was it a higher resolution so it would look better on this other video format monitor and and that's a whole aspect of what um the next day of probably classroom will be after we get done with this first day is kind of going through those projects and kind of helping people understand. And this is all just going to be meant to be enough to entice these guys to hire me each <laughs> themselves, you know, to come mm-hmm. out and, and, and expand upon this even more. Um, I think talking about that is going to be very important. And he mm-hmm. also had mentioned the um, that they they are all over the place when it comes to HDMI or SD, HD SDI downscaling to like how are they getting it onto these monitors because they're not so so here's the thing that's happening they sat on all their video equipment and I mean a lot of these places just stored it the video equipment any of the analog video tapes mm. and things that were from the 80s and 90s they just stored this stuff in warehouses and it's to the point now where we've proven you can open up brand new tapes from the 1990s and they'll have mildew growing on them. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they've they've realized this is the point now. They, they've kind of like let it just sit back there for 20 years, maybe longer, and, and done nothing besides sit it in cold storage. So now it's like we need to bring this stuff out and preserve it or there will be a repeat of what has happened before in history where you go back and this stuff's degraded, you lose it. And it's gone forever. And it could be just some artist's video of something that, uh, who knows? I mean, we we don't know what we're tapping here into this art world. So there's an element of um, preservation because, okay, you've you've tapped into an interesting idea here. So, okay, I think we got the idea that the, the TV matters. Um, the TV matters and maybe if um, our listeners are coming from a video games perspective uh, I would say the analogy in the video games world may be uh, the old argument oh, oh did the designers design it on composite and did they mean to have the composite shading effect on Sonic with the waterfall you know is that what they meant or did they mean hard RGB with hard pixels 
um, this level of artistic intent is um, that would be the analogy into the video game sphere. And we both know that that's an endless argument that will never be settled. <laughs> uh, also, because yeah. they're not um, often our video games are not made by one person. Um, right. Know, a team or something like that. Where here I could imagine that a video artist going to a museum may be more clear and maybe like, look, this is my installation. It's going to go from museum to museum and... I need this TV and I need this and I need this look. And they may have been more upfront about it. That's exactly. And, and he said it, that more or um, because a lot of these artists are still alive that originally created this and they have obviously mm -hmm. own their copyright to their work. So they still get paid by these private museums for their installations, just like any copyrighted material you know to be used publicly because the museum then charges money to have the event sure. gets money from it so that's um he said that there's some guys that are just like no i was designed specifically for hmm. this it has to be i'll allow for these three monitors <laughs> or the other people are like oh, i don't know whatever use whatever because right, okay, they yeah. were like I got whatever CRT I got, and, and like I said, this Korean guy, he was like, it was a beautiful exhibit, so he mm. didn't really care, and I think the reason he brought that up was he was giving them the leeway to use PVMs, so they used PVMs, but it didn't have that same effect, of course, because we're not, the, they've then increased the line count mm. from a 150 to 200 line generic, terrible CRT to... You know, a, 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 at the time, three thousand dollar machine that was the mm. best in the world <laughs> at, at at displaying composite video, and then you have mm. an expert come in and calibrate them. So right. it's like um, it, it's it's very fun. It's very challenging because it's like way more than I thought uh, I was going to have to be covering, and cool. um, like lists so upon I, lists and, of, and of other things. And that's kind that of that one. Yeah. Wait, wait, just, and also the quickly on that same matter. So the TV matters or it doesn't matter apparently, or it matters to the artist. Maybe it doesn't matter to the artist, but then the um, museum might, as you say, stick a PVM there and just go, nah, nah, this isn't, you know, it. yeah, it I'm not the it's artist, like, but I can tell like, nah, right. this isn't they, it. They, they themselves are so passionate about their stuff and they want to bring mm -hmm. this there and they get it there. It's just like if you... Yeah, if you had anything, any show, you're like, oh, uh, this just didn't you're turn right. out it's as not, I'm, I'm not I, I was it. had this. Yeah, they're it's the like biggest judges because the movie, they're like, my job depends on how many people come to yeah. actually see this. And then they turn around and talk about it and it ends up on social media and it ends up in uh, having articles bit written about it. And then, you know, enough of a draw. Right. It's just like mm -hmm. anything, I'm sure. So I would imagine uh, that's like when I watch uh, like if I watch some online thing and it's like a movie that was in 24 frames a second but they've upscaled it to 60 and it you can tell it looks like dog shit because 24 doesn't divide into 60 but before just quickly I, another point that you said that was very interesting was okay so it's about tvs but something has to play that something yeah, has to play that the, signal that's a big problem and so then the is the uh unit the maybe a vcr it could i imagine a lot of these dudes were literally a freaking vcr with a you know, vhs tape so how's that vcr unit playing how's that going and then preservation of the vcr tape do we to preserve it then and then you have choices do we try to dub that to another tape is that gonna have degradation do There's you then and then as you kind of alluded do you digitize that and oi vey, right. then you're well, in a that's, whole other world? Well, that's that's the route they're doing is they're going to digitize as much of this as possible to save it in a different format. So mm -hmm. that's what I have to, and that's, I have like this, this is going to be exactly what we're talking about here. This is going to be an open discussion with these guys because I have no idea what they're doing. I want to have uh, kind of like open discussion, pick their brains on what they're doing and seeing if they mm. can maybe see that some of that's the right, approach some of it might not be the right approach but at the same time like yeah how are you digitizing that f that original film and what are you digitizing it to what is the format you're digitizing it to i believe most of the time they're digitizing it to some type of type of 480p and then they're wow. sending that 480p signal and then they are all downscaling that 480p out of hdmi most of the time <clears throat> right into composite 
into okay. a, a, a CRT. So then he's it's like he told me this and I'm like, oh, my goodness. So they're having all kinds of issues where they're just like, what's the weakest link? Just like any of us gamers, what's the mm. weakest link in your setup? It's it's like you've spent thousands on every piece and it all comes down to this little HDMI to S or S video or HDMI to composite video and co decoder descaler. That's a right. piece of junk that we all get from Amazon because we just underappreciate it now. And they're going to underappreciate it more because they have no care for lag. So latency, mm -hmm. the only way latency matters is if, if the audio doesn't match up. Right. I mean, lag mm -hmm. will have no effect on just watching video. Um, sure, sure, sure. so because there's no input reaction uh, mm. so that's like the, their biggest thing is going to be i'm so that's what i'm gonna say like what are you using for this and then talk mm -hmm. about the some good options that are from downscalers that are like high-end options probably ones that i can't even get i'm gonna mm -hmm. have to like email bob or dm bob after this and be like bob what do you have that's like do you have ridiculous. the gps control do you have yeah, the gps have that. control yeah. take that with you that sounds yeah, like something that, that, that i think that maybe they i probably use. will and um so that's another thing that mm. an idea right there so there you go gbs control that's what i was thinking i was like the gbs control but i don't know how yeah. like museums feel about open source stuff so i'm going to test those waters too and see what their even sure. opinion is of that because you know a lot of those guys like to get in with these companies and like oh we only work at the co you know so you don't know mm. but yeah so I know we got 25 minutes into this, and I wanted to make sure it's, right, that every, going, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, but everybody just understand the discussion here today. Um, I wanted everybody to understand that there's a whole new world of preservation. A lot of times I get wondering, like, where's the real CRT? You know, how much more can it really grow within gaming? And, like, how many? I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, most people know about it. A lot of people have gone through the full cycle. I've watched them of really wanting a CRT, loving it, having it falling out of love with it <laughs> jumping out of gaming and then i see their crt for sale and who knows what else hobby they've jumped into which is cool that's what we all do sure. uh, but this is like it, it's it's more exciting to me because it's like a whole industry now is mm. is empowering this they have a lot of money behind them and this is like i was looking at the funding for these people it's like carnegie mellon funding so it's like you know this is the most funded stuff and and they he's like there's a fire under them and it's only getting hotter like huh. and they know it so i want everybody to know that like i am dedicating a lot of time to this program over the next couple of weeks i do plan to have a lot more information coming about this trip i've even got some special stuff set up to hopefully film they've allowed me access to like these panasonic 4k cameras they just got in this week two of okay. them to like film whatever I want at the museum for a cool. day. So I'm going to have something there, but um, I wanted everybody to know that so that, you know, if there's a, like a, a, you know, not as much content as normally this time, it, that's why. So um, we will, Lewis and I will continue to update and talk through his normal channel on Zez Retro. We will be there with this podcast. We normally do it weekly when we can. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know more, just continue to jump over there. Um, but I think as far as like the vast majority of the important things here is, is at least from my meeting yesterday, that's it. And it's, I'm super excited about it. Uh, I think it's a big deal, especially for me to be able yeah. to get like some, we've been talking about trying to get some more like legitimate, uh, steady business stuff. And mm -hmm. this is like, this could be the opportunity of, uh, a lifetime pretty much. It is. It's good for for everyone. I mean, don't get us don't get us wrong. That the patrons and the and the customers that you have very appreciative. Uh, Absolutely, you know, will always continue doing that work has provided a steady stream of work. But you know, like think about it. This guy here, this other guy I'm talking to, he fixes old TVs, and that's supposed to be his job, support his family, do everything. <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta find um, the ways to diversify, and this is a way to diversify that can grow your business. And I know we've talked about this already at the podcast before. How does retro tech grow? Well, boom, this yeah. is it right this here. Is, this is a good chance. Like this more than I chance. thought that I, I like, I'm not, I'm always the kind of the pessimist on this stuff. Cause I've been in like businesses and run my own business for 12 <laughs> years. And like, I don't even like to say anything about a business deal till the check is in my hand. 
mm-hmm. and I can walk away with it, you know? And like, then I have the money. That's, that's what I consider a deal like sealed. I don't <laughs> consider even like a signed contract to be meaningful. <laughs> Sometimes money, baby. it's like, show me just, the money, baby. Yeah. That's it. But at the end of the day, it's like, once you get paid, then you're like, yeah, this is real. This is happening. So, mm. um, that's tremendous, what's going on man. with it's me. Tremendous. And uh, but I I was uh, I was I was also blown away because I thought that you had an awesome project. Which I mean, you know, it's not going to the museum or anything. But I still thought that your last project with S Video and Composite <laughs> was just awesome. And uh, thanks, man. I really enjoyed it when I was away on my trip. So I mean, what do you want to say about maybe that one a little bit? Okay, well, um, I think what we'll do right now is we'll wrap up this one here. It's a tight 30 minutes for the main RetroTech channel. You've heard about what Steve is uh, doing. If you ha- if you don't hear as much out of him recently or if there's not as many of these, it's because the- he's fighting the good fight, doing the good work out there uh, and-, and doing something really, you know, the next level up for preserving CRTs. And um, yeah, so what we encourage you to do now, come over to my channel, Zez Retro, if you haven't already been there. We've got the Cathode Ray podcast. We do it every week. We do a little more casual. We're going to talk about Steve's holiday. We're going to talk about this video that I made recently on the new uh, S-Video cores uh, for the Mister that have been produced by Mike Simone. You can get native S-Video out of the Mister. I think I think it's a tremendous step up. There's so many things that are a step up for Mister. It's a tremendous step up, and I wanted to just explain how the cabling works. Um, it's not that difficult to understand, but I just wanted to put all that information in one spot. So we'll see you over on the Zez Retro channel for Cathode Ray Podcast number 22. Thanks very much for your time today. That's right. Go now. (laughs) Ciao.